Okay, I think it's time to start uh, week five session. Uh, again, welcome back to introduction to satellite remote sensing for air quality application. Uh, this is the last week in five week long uh, webinar series. And today uh, we are going to talk about future satellite capabilities for air quality monitoring. And we will also see We, so before going into the uh, agenda for today's talk, uh, just a quick that overview of last five weeks. Uh, in the week one, we did cover fundamental of remote sensing. Uh, in week two, we did uh, satellite imageries. And in week three and four, we covered aerosols and trash gas data. And today we are going to talk about some of the upcoming missions and what to expect from the satellite data uh, as uh, we move into future. So here is the outline. Um, uh, we'll have we'll talk about some of the future capabilities and missions, and then we have a guest speaker today uh, who will introduce uh, aerosols product from the geostation satellite and uh, in near real time data access uh, from one of the NASA uh, services. Uh, Towards the end, I will review the webinar series uh, just to recap what we have learned in all these things. And then uh, lastly, we will talk about uh, some of the upcoming trainings uh, and other opportunities to learn more about uh, air quality applications using satellite data sets. Okay, to, so this uh, image has been probably shown multiple times uh, during this uh, webinar series, but uh, this is really an important uh, image uh, which does list uh, uh, several NASA missions, uh, either they are in orbit or in planning stage or uh, they, are, they have been in the orbit for a long time uh, and providing important uh, air quality information. So just to refresh your memory, uh, all these instruments which are uh, arrowed here in the bottom, uh, bottom right side, Terra, Aqua, Calypso, Aura, uh, these are primary uh, satellite missions which does provide some kind of air quality information either on trace case or aerosols. Uh, we also have some uh, SUNY NPP, which is a partnership between NOAA and NASA. And then we also have a OCO2 mission, which does provide carbon monoxide and other things. So these are some of the missions. And if you look on the top, there are some of the uh, missions which are in formulation stage, means they are in planning stage. Uh, like a tempo, which we'll talk a little bit. Pace is another mission which will provide important information on uh, atmospheric aerosols. And then there are some other instruments uh, which will provide uh, data used for other application than air quality. So moving forward, the first uh, upcoming mission, uh, which is designed uh, to monitor air quality uh, from the geostationary orbit. Uh, so as we talked in week one, geostationary or, uh, satellites are located uh, around 36,000 kilometer above the uh, Earth's surface. And that orbits make it possible that uh, you can observe same region of the Earth uh, with very high uh, uh, temporal resolution. And TEMPO is one of that kind of mission. So the TEMPO stands for stratospheric emissions monitoring of pollution. Uh, it's specifically designed to give data over Northern America. So this is only uh, available, the data from the TEMPO will be only available over Northern America and some Central American uh, part. It's uh, Special resolution is about one hour and it can vary actually depending on what we are trying to do. The special resolution is also very high. It varies from 2.2 kilometer to 4.7 kilometer. Uh, it's a hyperspectral instrument. Uh, it's very similar to OMI instrument which we talked in 
week two, week three, and four, uh, and uh, but it has some more wavelengths than ohm instrument. So it start from 219 nanometer to 714 nanometer, and this range of spectral bands allows uh, will allow Tempo to provide uh, useful information on uh, ozone, uh, NO2, SO2, formaldehyde. Uh, aerosols, cloud parameter, and surface reaching UV radiation. So, this will provide a complete uh, or more complete sets of uh, information required to characterize the air quality events on the surface. Like I said, this is still in planning stage. So, the expected launch date as of now is uh, uh, 2020. So, keep uh, Keep an eye on this instrument. Uh, here are some more details about uh, tempo footprint. Uh, like any uh, other instruments, uh, the pixel size or the spatial resolution does vary a little bit uh, uh, based on where uh, you are at, uh, in terms of the geographical location. So uh, the pixel location changes from east to west and from north to south. Uh, in case of tempo, it will most of the Konos region, it will have very high resolution about four to five kilometer from east west direction and about two to three kilometer in the north south direction. But when you go to the edge of the south or to the disk in this case, then the pixel resolution actually decreases. It means uh, the size of the pixel increases and that can create some time problem. But in most cases, it is still pretty good uh, within the uh, prescribed spatial resolution. And that can be very, very useful you know, to characterize small scale air quality events. Another sensors uh, which will provide uh, very, very useful information on atmospheric aerosols uh, uh, for air quality monitoring. Again, this will be uh, uh, United States mission, so it will provide data on over US and some part of uh, uh, Central America and uh, Southern America. And it is in series of uh, already existing GOES uh, uh, images, which are in orbit, uh, several of them, which does provide very useful information on the weather. So this is uh, more like a weather satellite. Uh, but uh, this is a uh, very advanced version of a weather satellite which include uh, new capabilities to provide data on environmental as well. Uh, this is expected to launch uh, this year. I believe uh, the date of launch is October in October. And one of the sensor on the GOZAR is called Advanced Westline Imager. Uh, it is 16 spectral band and the temporal resolution from the GOZAR will be uh, anywhere from 15 minutes to 30 seconds uh, depending on your application and uh, requirement. Uh, the, the beauty of GOZAR is that it has 16 different, uh, uh, it, it will make measurement of earth atmosphere land system in 16 different spectral channel and as we learn in week one and week two, that as we have more and more number of bands, we are able to distinguish between different features of Earth and atmosphere system. And we can also extract more piece of information about certain uh, component of the atmospheres or Earth system. And you can see that here in this example, uh, where uh, image of the United States is taken into 16 different bands and you can see uh, how uh, different bands shows same uh, piece of uh, earth uh, in uh, different colors or different uh, values. So uh, using this uh, capabilities of multispectral, we can extract uh, uh, much more information uh, which was uh, limited in the current uh, version of GOES uh, satellites. Here is a quick comparison between uh, the proposed or the uh, the AVI uh, advanced baseline imager which will be on board on the GOES or compared to the current GOES imager. So like the spectral coverage 
AVI will be 16 band versus 5 bands. Uh, the spatial resolution uh, will vary in the Gozar from half kilometer to kilometer, whereas the current goes is about 1 kilometer to 4 kilometer. Uh, the spatial coverage uh, full disk will be uh, four images per one hour, uh, whereas the current goes is uh, you can get only one image every three hours and it is scheduled. Uh, for the conus region, you will get at least 12 images for the conus region per hour, whereas the current goes image provides only four images per hour. Uh, if you are interested in a specific mesoscale event, then it can be zoomed in and can get uh, uh, data every 30 seconds, which is not available in GOES, current GOES image. Uh, one more useful, very important uh, development of GOES R is that it has onboard calibration, uh, which is not available in the GOES, uh, current version of GOES imager. And this onboard calibration is uh, very, very important in terms of maintaining the data quality over longer time period. Because as we learn that uh, over the time, uh, the instrument degrades and its uh, data quality can be uh, tricky. So if we have onboard calibration, then we can actually continuously calibrate with some constant source and that uh, make sure that the data quality is good. Okay, so those two missions were focused only over United States. So, mm -hmm. and so the data from the rest of the world will not be available from those two missions. But it does not mean that uh, there are other missions which are being planned or already in orbit, which does provide or will provide data sets uh, from other parts of the uh, world. So there is a sentinel, there is a, uh, efforts to build a constellation of a, a satellite which will make global pollution monitoring and the expected launch of this uh, constellation is between 2018 to 2020 and Tempo is part of that constellation. Uh, the over Europe, uh, European Space Agency is planning to launch a uh, satellite uh, uh, called Sentinel-4, which will also provide uh, similar capabilities as TEMPO, and it will cover Europe and some part of Northern Africa. Uh, Korean Space Agency is launching another satellite called JAMS, uh, which is again very similar to TEMPO and OMI, and it will be a geostationary mission. It will provide uh, coverage to uh, to Eastern Asia and mm, will have similar capabilities as Tempo. So once we have all these instruments in orbit, uh, we will get a constellation of satellite uh, which will provide very high temporal resolution information on air quality uh, over most part of the global uh, at least in the northern hemisphere. Uh, apart from the GST satellite, uh, there are other uh, instruments being planned, uh, which is uh, one of them is called TROP OMI. Uh, it's again European mission and it's a it will be launched in polar orbit in uh, so it will have a global coverage. Uh, the TROP OMI is uh, uh, very, very similar to OMI instrument, uh, but at high spatial resolution. So as you remember, uh, we talked about the OMI data, which is 13 by 24 kilometer. And as you go at the edge of the SWAT, uh, its uh, resolution really reduced. Uh, in terms of the TROP OMI, the spatial resolution will be about uh, seven kilometer. Uh, TROP OMI will provide data on ozone, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, formaldehyde, aerosols, clouds, uh, surface reaching UV radiation, and uh, other trace gases such as methane and other, other things. So this is going to be a very, very critical mission uh, in terms of providing atmospheric composition 
uh, over global region with very high spatial resolution. Okay, so one of the existing uh, geostation satellite uh, from the Japan Meteorological Agency uh, launched by the JAXA is called Himawari. Uh, Himawari was launched in 2000, October 2014, so it is already in orbit for almost two years now, and it is providing very high resolution uh, with high temporal resolution um, images every 10 minutes, uh, and it does cover. You can see as in the slide, the coverage is it does provide most of the. Uh, Eastern Hemisphere, which include both Northern and Southern Hemisphere, uh, so mostly Japan, China, all of the Asia and Australia, New Zealand and other part in Pacific Ocean. And uh, we have a guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Aaron Nagar. Uh, he is uh, at University of Alabama in Huntsville. Uh, he works with Marshall Space Flight Center uh, uh, of one of the NASA centers and he is looking into using combining uh, aerosols data from uh, polar orbiting and geostationary satellites to uh, make the data available on more frequent time period for operational agencies uh, so that they can use the data in near real time. So from here I will switch over to Dr. Aaron Neger. He will talk about the his data sets and his program and then we will towards the end we will come back and we'll review the webinar series and we'll take care of other uh, items in the list thank you Aaron you are on thank, thank you. you Colin can everybody hear me can you hear me okay so okay so today we'll be going over the the NASA sport near real-time aerosol optical depth composite product which uh, Colin just introduced and move forward here. And so there are numerous satellite sensors that have been used for retrieving aerosol optical depth or AOD, as Pollen just mentioned during his talk. However, these AOD retrievals from these single single satellite sensors alone can provide an incomplete representation of the aerosol spatial distribution due to cloud cover effects, sun glint and sensor limitations, such as the spatial resolution and scan coverage. For these cloudy regions, AOD retrieval algorithms utilize cloud screening techniques to disregard or ignore these biased high AOD retrievals due to the difficulty in separating the visible reflectance of clouds from aerosols. Unfortunately, when screening out these AOD um, in the cloudy regions, it can significantly reduce the AOD spatial distribution which is kind of a, we're pointing out here on the figure on the right where the average cloud cover over the North Pacific and North Atlantic exceeded 90% uh, between July 2006 and June 2007. And this is unfortunately right in the, air, the regions where there can be long range transport of aerosols, which can limit the, uh, the ability to monitor and track these. These often cloudy regions, um, like I said, are, are often pathways for these long-range aerosol transport. And um, there have been advances and improvements in AOD retrievals for absorbing aerosols above clouds, uh, but they do rely on additional assumptions that often lead to uncertainties um, greater than 50%. So um, these AOD retrieval algorithms that have been developed for these low Earth orbiting LEO and geostationary orbit geo sensors have complementary advantages and disadvantages. And we're kind of highlighting those here. The low Earth orbiting or LEO satellite sensors, such as MODIS and VIRS, generally only observe the same location once per daytime period and can have large data coverage gaps in the equatorial region. On the other hand, these LEO sensors can have more frequent data coverage at high latitudes due to multiple overpasses over the same location. And they also have numerous spectral bands, which help develop more robust, less uncertain aerosol retrievals. The geosensors, on the other hand, on the other hand such as AHI and GOES, they do provide more frequent scans. There's every, as 
I believe Powman um, talked about it earlier, for AHI, they get every 10 minutes. So over the same region, which allows for aerosol monitoring and tracking. And they have no, none of these data coverage gaps over their field of view. However, they can have a limited number of aerosol retrievals at the high latitudes, and this is due to decreasing spatial resolution and elevated AOD uncertainties in these regions. So here are some examples of AOD retrievals from, here on the right, from the MODIS and Beers sensors. Now note these are regridded onto a half degree domain uh, for the six hour period from 3 to 9 UTC on March 4, 2016. We regrid these on a half degree domain because our AOD composite product is also on a half degree domain. Um, so as we can see here, the MODIS Aqua True Color here on the left um, depicts some extensive cloud cover over the region, especially as they move north northward. And the areas affected by sun glint are also shown. Some regions contaminated by aerosols are also evident in the MODIS True Color. We can see the pollution over here on the Western Pacific area and also some polluted regions over China and down here in Southeast Asia as well, which is likely due to a combination of smoke and pollution in this region. And over the Tech, the Tecmacan, I believe that's pronounced correctly, desert, uh, there is a dust plume, which is difficult to pick out over the bright reflecting surface over the desert, but it is still recognizable on the most true color. Now, if we move over to our AOD retrievals here on the right from the Modus Nervirs, they do help quantify uh, what we're showing on the Modus True Color as far as the thickness or optical depth of these aerosol plumes, which helps us better understand the aerosol distribution over this region. We can see this uh, elevated AOD um, associated with the pollution in this region on the veers and also on the modus. Uh, we can see the smoke and pollution, the elevated AOD over uh, Southeast Asia and India, and also over Nepal. And of course, we can also depict on the modus AOD, the elevated, uh, actually extreme AOD associated with the dust plume over that region. Now it is interesting that the veers AOD misses completely the dust over the bright land surface and this is uh, very likely due to some issues with their um, with a bright surface algorithm for beers. So for this work, we um, we're developing a near real time or near global near real time comprehensive representation of the aerosol spatial distribution through merging multi sensor AOD retrievals by utilizing the complementary advantages and disadvantages of the LEO and GEO sensors that we um, discussed earlier. This merged product we refer to as a NASA Sport AOD composite product. And like I said, this merges LEO, and, uh, LEO MODIS, and VIR sensors and the GEO, AHI, and GOES sensors. We utilize already existing AOD retrieval algorithms for the MODIS and VIRs. Um, and the MODIS AOD, we actually download from the NASA's Land Atmospheric Near Real Time Capability for Earth Observing System, LANCE, while the VIRS AOD um, is downloaded from the NOAA Comprehensive Large Array Data uh, System. Now, for the uh, AHI and GOES, we actually develop our own AOD retrieval algorithms. And our final uh, composite product merges these LEO and GEO retrievals onto a common half degree grid domain. And for the in-depth details of this product, you can refer to this publication shown here at the bottom of the slide. So here's an example right here of the uh, AHI. So we saw in the last slide, one second here. So yeah, our, our um, our AHI AOD algorithm here is a critical component of our NASA Sport AOD composite product. And we kind of identify that here on this slide where we have our AHI shown every hour. However, note that we could show this every 10 minutes because the, the uh, but that would take up a large portion and be very small screenshots here. So we show every hour 
Um, and this can this is highlighting the ability of AHI to uh, monitor and track these aerosol plumes over this over this region. And this AHI time series highlights the uh, varying pollution conditions over Nepal. You can kind of see over here over the uh, Nepal North India region the uh, AOD is somewhat increasing from about you know 0 0.5 0 0.6 values and uh, we're reaching 1.2 to 1.5 as the as the daytime progresses here. And on top of that, we we can also see kind of the propagation of this dust plume in the, in this region um, as it propagates east propagates eastward uh, from the Taklamakan Desert. Now um, our current AHI algorithm does require the solar zenith angle to be less than uh, 70 degrees. So you can kind of see the limited uh, to no sunlight impacting our field of view here as we do approach these later evening hours. So as we approach the 8 UTC hour, the uh, AHI AOD coverage is limited due to that solar zenith angle restriction here. Um, for this March March 4th date that we have here. Now uh, the AHI, hopefully you were introduced this earlier, but the AHI has very similar capabilities and also same number of spectral bands, 16, as the GOES R, which was introduced earlier. So the capabilities are very similar between AHI and GOES R. Okay, so we saw in the, la in the last slide that the AOD coverage over our AHI field of view can be restricted at these high solar and viewing zenith angles, which is due to a lar the very large uncertainties that can be encountered in these areas. So here we see the boundary of um, the viewing zenith angle restriction of the AHI, shown here from the 6 UTC timestamp on March 4th. The VIRS, on the other hand, is capable. The VIRS grounded product is capable of um, showing these AOD retrievals on the west side of our domain here. Therefore, these LEO AOD uh, can help supplement the lack of GEO AOD in these particular re regions. Also, another advantage of these LEO sensors is they have much higher spatial resolution compared to the GEO sensors at these higher solar zenith, solar and viewing zenith angles. So, in other words, we can combine these LEO AOD retrievals, um, or the LEO AOD can provide critical information into uh, our sport AOD product as, as well. Now, note here that AHI is shown at a two kilometer uh, resolution, so you see much finer details. Uh, we, would we would see those finer details on the VIRS uh, composite AOD here if we showed the uh, raw. AOD data, but we do re regret this, but I um, just want to point that out before I move forward. So uh, we saw, we showed the same images from the last slide here on the left, but we also are showing the uh, complete or final product of the Sport AOD six hour version for this three to nine UTC timestamp on March 4th. Our um, overall, our merged geo Leo product here leads to a uh, much increased aerosol spatial distribution over this region. And uh, we maintain that high quality nature of the original product as well. More information on that can be um, found in the publication. For example, the uh, dust transport from the Takamakan Desert in this region can is well depicted uh, from as it's transported from uh, the west portions of China over the east portions of the of the country. The pollution also on the on the over East Asia here is shown very well. And the smoke and pollution aerosols that are hampering a much larger portion, you can see that the smoke and pollution aerosols are hampering a much larger portion of uh, Southeast Asia and India compared to what was depicted on the uh, Beers AOD over here on the left. So you can kind of see uh, the, that our merged product does lead to this uh, more robust aerosol spatial distribution that can be used for uh, various air quality and uh, applications.
So here we are showing one of the applications for our Sport AOD product. And this is mainly for local, regional, aerosol and air quality monitoring purposes. We're showing another example here from uh, June 6 of this year. And our Sport AOD composite product is shown here on the right, the most true color on the left. And the most true color reveals some possible locations of that are affected by, by dust over the Takamakan um, and pollution, the smoke plumes uh, over the east side of Asia here, and uh, some smoke plumes actually from uh, over in the northeast portion of the image as well. And our composite, our AOD uh, product here can provide, kind of shows, depicts these areas and the overall picture of the aerosol activity across this region on the on this picture today. Now we see the you know higher pollution or elevated AOD associated with the pollution over East Asia. We're depicting the, the, the pretty extreme AOD with the dust plume in this region, as long as the uh, as well as the smoke plume over the Pacific, shown here. Now we do also show some potential issues with uh, these geo sensor algorithms, and one is the potential cloud contamination here. Uh, near the Philippines, and uh, which is likely leading to falsely high AOD in this region. So if we move forward here, our another, um, our shorter, we do also produce shorter term AOD products, uh, three hour and a one hour that can provide more near real time on our training and tracking of aerosols and air quality. This example is again from the June, June 6th study we showed in the previous slide. The same basic features are are depicted on the three hour and one hour composite product products on the slide. However, the three hour as expected provides more AOD coverage across the domain. We're taking to more we're taking into account more overpasses and more AOD information into this three hour product. So we can see these polluted regions over over East Asia and um, over North India and near Nepal here, and uh, some dust over the, that dusty region over the Takamakan. Now our, um, our one hour products over here uh, are more useful for actually visualizing and monitoring the propagation and dispersion of the smoke plume in the northeast part of our image right here. Our one hour product also reveals a variation in the pollution aerosols that are impacting East Asia. Um, and you can kind of see that the pollution is more dense or denser over this region uh, from the hours of 2 to 3 and 4 to 5 UTC in, this, in these one hour time, time stamps shown here. And then by the evening hours, we're seeing the pollution uh, somewhat uh, become less thick in the evening hours. So we actually originally developed this product um, for monitoring and tracking the long range transport of aerosols. In particular, we developed it for the Cal Water 2 field campaign over North California to um, help with the field investigation and to help monitor the the dust and pollution plumes that cross the Pacific for that particular campaign. And our six hour and daily AOD composite products have, have this utility in tracking and monitoring these long range transport aerosols. And here we show an example of the recent fire outbreak uh, in, in Russia that occurred from mid to late July. Our six hour product here on July 23rd show some extreme AOD values uh, near and above three that are clearly evident in this smoke or in this uh, modus true color as well. The smoke plume does propagate eastward over the next couple days and by July 25th right here there are uh, some extreme AOD over the east portions of Asia 
associated with this transport of smoke plume. It's a little more difficult here to separate the very thick smoke from the extensive cloud feature in this modus true color on July 25th. However, you can kind of depict where these where these cloud free smoke regions are um, on on the uh, sport 80 composite up here on the top, which helps uh, kind of deci decipher where these cloud free regions are. All right, so you know, although, although our uh, AOD composite, I mean our AHI AOD retrieval algorithm that is used to generate these sport AOD composite products appears to be working fairly well. We are currently working towards a refined, more robust version of the algorithm. Our current AHI algorithm is primarily based on the algorithm we developed for the MT set imager, which is now no longer operating, which only carried five spectral bands. So we plan to fully utilize the, the 16 bands on board AHI to improve our cloud screening technique, which helps to which will help limit some of these cloud contamination issues. We also uh, plan to improve our surface reflectance retrieval approach with this algorithm. And you know at, we will be validating these re refinements uh, against the intensive field measurements during the course AQ campaign that occurred over Korea. And also we plan to incorporate a technique in our algorithm to separate between aerosol types. These newer generation sensors have the ability to separate between these dust, pollution, and smoke types due to the additional spectral information that we're, that we're getting from these new geo sensors. Uh, and also, on kind of a similar note there, due to the increasing spatial resolution of the geo sensors and, uh, for example, the, the MODIS AOD now has a three kilometer AOD product, we are planning to increase the spatial resolution of our composite product to uh, maybe 0.2 degree, even down to 0.1 degree um, in the coming months. And finally, we can extend our now we originally developed it at, at a, I should note that we developed it at a half degree resolution um, from the beginning because we were focused on uh, helping to monitor and transport the long range transport aerosol plumes, which have, which are more ho homogeneous. And so the half degree grid domain was not a huge issue when, when analyzing those kind of situations. However, when you do get down to smaller scale or fine scale aerosol events such as localized urban pollution and small fires, that half degree grid domain can be um, problematic. So increasing the resolution can will be good for those type of events. And also uh, we plan to extend our refined AHI algorithm to the geostationary, uh, well, like Palin pointed out, the GOZAR, which is planned for launch in October or November of this year. All right, and that, and now we're moving on to one of our final slides here for data access and display. The users here can access the AOD composite product uh, through the NAS support web page. A uh, link is shown here. I'm, I'll provide a live demo of this in a minute, so I won't go too much into the in-depth details here. But the basic instructions for viewing the, the imagery online and accessing our FTP server. Are shown here, so you can follow those steps and get to the data as you wish. And finally, I just want to show one more uh, picture here of our AOD composite product in Google Earth display. This is for the same that uh, this is for the fire or smoke outbreak over Russia on July 24th. So this Google Earth. Can viewing has viewing capabilities that allow users to, you know, browse the entire AOD composite domain while also being able to zoom in on different regions for closer analysis. So that can be good for those purposes. All right, and now I think it's time to begin the live demo. Hopefully, I remember how to do this. Issues here. All right, so here is the sport web page, and. It's pretty simple to get to the composite product. You 
go up to the real time data tab here and uh, go to aerosol products and uh, Aaron. Yep. Aaron, quick question can you let me zoom your uh, web page it's very hard to see oh, what yeah. you're showing can do that i've got the keys to do that <laughs> I'm sorry, what are the keys to do that? I completely forgot. I'm sorry, what was that? Okay. There we are. Is that better? Yeah, that looks great. All right, so we can, uh, here's a NASA support webpage and to get to the AOD composite data, you can go to the real time data tab on the top left and go to aerosol products and then click on the AOD composite link here. I'm trying to talk slow due to the possible interruptions with the or delay time and you should be able to see here the our viewing page of the composite product um, here we're just showing a six hour composite of over the Pacific domain um, you can actually move around and select different dates up here on the pull down select date tab and um, you know also we do have different domains here as well for over in India Australia um, and we will probably remove the chorus but we had it for the campaign nothing shown right there due to the limited daylight in that region right now but if we go to a region or a time period that more corresponds to let's go to for example 730 UTC on the second and this is over the Pacific domain um, you can see the you're now seeing the uh, AOD information over Asia um, then we can go to, and also you have these hourly, one hourly, and six hourly composites, and the daily composites shown here with different timestamps. So, for example, for this specific domain, if you go to the zero UTC timestamp on the on the second. It will show the entire composite product for that 24-hour period on this on this day. So you have a uh, very nice view of the aerosol information from you know the west parts of Asia all the way across over to the U.S. Um, you're seeing the looks like there's some possible dust plume activity over the Takmakan Desert right now and uh, possibly some aerosol activity over the east parts of Asia here. So yes, it's very nice. Uh, you can kind of then go to our six hour product on that day, uh, which has timestamps up here of 3, 9, and 21 UTC. So if we go to our 3 UTC timestamp, you can kind of see the six hour composite for that for that day. And also some of these have multiple products associated with them. So if we go to our zero, uh, let's see here. If we go to our 430, this is showing the three hour.
or they're not they're not highlighting up right now, but some of these do have multiple products associated with them. So you can go down here and click um, either on the one hour, three hourly, six hourly, or daily composite. Um, and also we have an animation feature with this. If we go to the hourly composite, for example, let's try to find one of those over the uh, chorus. Here we go. Just do a quick little demonstration of the hourly over this region. Right now at 23.30, there's limited daylight. I hope this works. Let's see here. And then we can go down here to the bottom and loop this. Try to find the dates here. Okay. I'm going to zoom out a little bit for my own purpose. Okay. okay. So if you loop through this, you can kind of see we're still in the daylight period. We're getting some AOD over the region. There's probably maybe extensive cloud cover over this. But the purpose of this is you can loop through these um, AOD composite images. Um, we're not seeing much information pop up right now, but there may be a uh, issue with our, our composites currently. But the capability is there. Um, if if users are interested in doing that. And finally, we do have KML files available, which you can click on that KML link right here. And if you scroll to the bottom of the real-time KML, our, our real-time KML KMV file page, you can go to the AOD product here, and you can download either the three hour, six hour, hour or daily composite for those. And if we do the Pacific domain, which is all we make available for the KM, the KML, because uh, users have the ability to browse around and do their own, uh, do their own browsing for those. We submit that. We can download the KMZ file. Download that. And then show one last example here of our product over Google Earth. And then here we go. So we have our Google Earth view of our daily AOD composite product. Um, we'll kind of focus in here over here on Asia. And you can kind of see the elevated regions of AOD uh, across that domain. All right. I think that's about it. For my time, I will pass it back to Pawan for the remaining discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Uh, please stay with us uh, for the question answers, and we'll take in uh, next five ten minutes. So let me uh, go over quickly the overview or the review of the webinar series uh, and talk about few more things. Uh, so uh, again. In week one, we talked about some of the fundamental of satellite remote sensing. We discussed uh, different satellite sensors and orbits like geostationary versus polar orbits. Uh, what is the difference between satellite and sensor? So each satellite can either have one sensor or it can have multiple sensors. And then we also talked about the spectral uh, different types of resolutions. And then we talked that uh, uh, it's always trade-off in remote sensing when we want to achieve very high spectral spatial radiometric and trample resolution at the same time. Uh, it was, it's not always possible to achieve uh, everything together. So we have to uh, trade off between different resolutions. Uh, and as technology is improving, we are getting um, better on be and better and better on that. Uh, and then we also talked about some of the limitations and advantage of having different uh, satellites. In week two, we learned about how to access near real time uh, satellite imagery through the world view, which is NASA's uh, near real time data provider, where you can get uh, several different types of uh, data sets in near real time. Uh, we learned about the importance of the visible satellite imagery, how we can identify different features like dust, smoke, uh, pollutions, 
haze, uh, clouds, fog, and various other things. So uh, that was week two. In week three, uh, we learned about uh, aerosol data, uh, atmospheric aerosol data. And atmospheric aerosol data are basically data which can be used to um, get information on surface level particulate matter air quality. Uh, we talked about various uh, sensors and data sets which are available. Primarily, we talked about uh, MODIS, which is uh, has two uh, sensors. One is in takes measurement in the morning, another takes measurement in the afternoon, and it does provide aerosol optical depth uh, at uh, 3 kilometer and 10 kilometer uh, spatial resolution, which can further be used to calculate PM2.5. Uh, we also talked a little bit about how we can calculate the PM2.5 and the differences between AOD and PM2.5. Again, remember uh, aerosol optical depth or AOD is a column measurement uh, which represents entire column of the surface, uh, column of the atmosphere from surface to the top of the atmosphere. Whereas PM2.5 is a surface measurement. It's for a specific size range of particles and it is measured at the ground so it represents ground level uh, nose level air pollution in another way so there are differences in these two quantities but uh, as we talked there are ways to calculate that uh, convert the aod to 2 pm 2.5 in the week four dr brian duncan uh, gave a very nice overview of uh, 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 satellite capabilities to uh, detect uh, various stress gases he focused on no2 and he has shown several applications uh, for oil and gas uh, for fires for long-term monitoring trends and other stuff uh, with, where the satellite data have been used uh, we also talked about a nasa website uh, it's called airquality.gsfc.nasa.gov uh, where you can access uh, NO2 data sets uh, and analysis and resources uh, to from the OMI census. And today, uh, I don't have to revise it, but basically we talked about the future uh, satellite sensors uh, and some of the existing uh, aerosol product from the geostationary. Dr. Aaron Negert uh, gave us very nice presentation on how to access the existing data sets uh, from the sports facility at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. And then uh, just want to re uh, make sure everybody that we do put all our materials uh, and there's a lot much information on our website. So our website is rset.gsfc.nasa.gov. And if you're only specifically interested in air quality, then slash air quality. Uh, we do list upcoming trainings here on the right side. Uh, we have a contact information if you in need to get more training or you have technical questions. And then one of the most important thing I would like to point everybody that we have a list of list segments. We have a list of people who would like to hear about the NASA RSET and air quality training program uh, on a regular basis. So we do send out uh, monthly emails uh, with the information about upcoming trainings, uh, other products available, and other kind of information. So, if you would like to receive daily info, uh, uh, monthly or regular information on the RSET program and training program, please click to this link and subscribe to the listserv, and then you will automatically add it into the list and you will receive regular information so that you don't have to come back to the website and check for available uh, trainings. With that, uh, one more thing uh, I would like to mention, uh, and this is specifically relevant to people in the United States and mm -hmm. surrounding region. Uh, we will be doing a one day long uh, in-person in hands-on training workshops on the topic, the practical use of satellite observations for visibility and air quality analysis. Uh, registration for this uh, specific one day long training program is open. It is hosted at the Air and West Management Association Conference on the Visibility in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Uh, the date for the training is September 26, 2016, so it's next month. 
this is in partnership with another uh, uh, professor at UC Davies uh, and the registration for this training is uh, still open and there are spots available so you can find more details on the training for this specific training by clicking this link uh, and you will see all the details there okay uh, now this is something which we are planning uh, as people who works on the sustainable development and so united nations has this goals uh, 17 different goals for sustainable development and this is to make the world better for everyone to live and out of the 17 goals uh, several of them have air quality as an important piece or requirement for human being and specifically two of the goal goal three which relates to good health and well-being and the goal 11 which is sustainable cities and communities uh, to address uh, certain air quality related is um, uh, targets for these two goals goals three and goals 11 uh, we have identified targets 11.6 uh, uh, and then each target has some indicators so one of the indicators is uh, level of ambient uh, particulate matter, both PM10 and PM2.5. And then annual mean level of this PM2.5 over cities uh, with population by date. And, and similarly, goal three, which is health related, has a population uh, urban area exposed to outdoor air pollution levels. Uh, above WHO guidelines. So World Health Organization has some guidelines on air quality which does provide. So to address these uh, sustainable development goal, uh, we will be conducting a online advanced webinar series on satellite derived annual PM2.5 data sets in support to United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And this webinar series will be conducted in the month of January 2017. So where we will talk about uh, existing data sets from the satellite uh, of the PM2.5, how to access the data, and then we will do some application using uh, learn some tools to analyze those PM2.5 data for various applications. So if you are interested in learning about that, please stay tuned with the RZ website or uh, register with our listserv. Uh, in next month or so, we will be finalizing the dates and other details and you will be uh, start you, and probably the registration will start sometime in October or November and then you will be able to register for this. So just uh, stay tuned if you are interested in learning more about PM 2.5. With that, uh, again, this is there is no assignment in this series. Uh, uh, all the materials are available here. Here is my contact information. And again, I would like to thank you everyone for attending this uh, five weeks series. Uh, I hope it is useful, uh, and I hope uh, you will be motivated to use the satellite data. Uh, at our at our set team, I would like to thank uh, um, Brock. Levin, who was very, very, uh, he did really hard work in putting together all the material and everything here on the site and managing all the registration and everything. And then other RCET team members who uh, works uh, in the background. So with that, uh, thank you everyone. And I will hand over to Brock. Uh, he will talk a little bit about the survey and then at the end we will take question answer so stay tuned for the question answer uh, brock over to you thank you so there is a lot of question in one of this so one of the thing is uh, uh, we do have planned uh, uh, several trainings uh, upcoming trainings and when i say in person training it means uh, they are in persons and people has to be present in there. They are not available online. Uh, there is a one on September 26 in the US, uh, which is in uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And there is a, another one in South Korea, 
on August 28 and 29, which will be in person, and they will not be available online. Although the material presented on those training will be available for everyone to view after the training completed. Uh, there are other questions related to Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2. Uh, I would request to look other uh, material on Landsat, specifically in the land training section of our RSET program, where you will find more information on Landsat data. Uh, global, your advice for global AOT display for PM computation. So, as we discussed in week two, week sorry, week three. Uh, there are several sensors which does provide uh, global aerosol optical depth uh, retrievals. Uh, among them, MODIS is one which does provide almost daily global coverage. Uh, VIRS is another new one. So, and they both are very useful in calculating PM 2.5. Okay, there is another question on GOES ABI. What is the width of wavelength on the images? I mean, instant 2.6 micron gaze get close to 2.24. Okay. Uh, I don't remember on top of my head, but I believe uh, each uh, wavelength is about uh, 10 to 20 nanometer in their width. So you can compute that in that way. So, but uh, if you are interested, please write to me and I will send you uh, very specific bandwidth detail of uh, each uh, uh, band of GOES ABI. Okay, I don't see any more questions uh, here. Uh, if you have question, please uh, go ahead and type in uh, both uh, Aaron and I am here for next five ten minutes uh, to answer those. Thank you. And uh, as you noticed, Brock has posted a link uh, uh, on the Landsat training uh, materials. So in order to get uh, answered your question related to Landsat 8, please refer to those uh, training material. Okay, so there is a question about is there any high resolution PM10 data available? Uh, okay, uh, I'm not uh, I'm not aware of any effort, efforts. Uh, where PM10 data uh, using satellite remote sensing have been created for the global reasons. There have been uh, some studies uh, uh, isolated uh, in different part of the world, but uh, there is no PM10 data derived from the satellite remote sensing available uh, as far as I know. Yeah, I can support Alan with that statement. I don't know of any either. Okay, so there is another question on long-term data access. Uh, I have a question about long-term data archive access. Is there a tool to access level two data with a special and temple selection without downloading and processing HDF files? No, the short answer is no. Uh, but there is a way if you know the programming skills, uh, then all the data uh, of level two of MODIS are available through a format called OpenDAP. Uh, and OpenDAP allows you to read the file over the internet and extract the data required for your region and, uh, and time period. So if, and that can be, ex, uh, you, you have to do some kind of a scripting or, uh, and there are codes available online. Uh, I will type in the website where you can get more information on that. So 
so uh, this is the data to this is the link to access the data online uh, uh, and which will not which will not required to download the hdf file Okay, there is another question on feature work on separating aerosols type and aerosol retrieval algorithm. Okay, so there is a sensor called MISER which does have some capability to separate uh, fine coarse and medium size of particle and it does uh, can provide some information on smoke versus uh, pollution aerosols. But again, those are on the research uh, uh, scale. Uh, at operational basis, uh, there is very limited uh, uh, resources currently. In futures, uh, when we have uh, tempo and pace mission, which have polarization capabilities, will be able to provide some more details on the aerosol type information. I guess I will chime in there a little bit. Sure. Um, I think they're referring to uh, my last slide on my future works. And uh, yeah, like, like Pawan uh, kind of hinted at, there is some ability, I believe, in separating uh, between fine mode and core coarse mode aerosol types uh, from the AHI sensor for example if you if you have that information um, there is I believe three or four visible bands on board um, the AHI sensor which allows for some separation between those coarse mode dust like species versus the, the fine mode pollution aerosol types um, would you agree with that statement Colin? yes I, I think that's right uh... Now, as far as like separating between pollution and smoke, that's a much more difficult problem with the AHI um, bands available, but the different fine mode type species. But when you get the, the coarse versus fine mode, you can do some separation between those with the uh, capabilities on board AHI and modus and beers. Okay, there is another question. Is it possible to download EDR from the Let's Web website? Uh, this is about Veer's uh, aerosol optical depth product. Uh, I believe not. Uh, Veer's EDR product is a NOAA product. NOAA is a National Oceanic Ad and Atmospheric Administration. It's a different agency. Uh, and currently, Let's Web uh, does not host that data. Uh, in week three of my presentation, uh, I have a link uh, of a NOAA website where you can download the data uh, from VIRS uh, at six kilometers spatial resolution. Yes, so somebody has uh, given the class NOAA website here. And just to inform you that uh, NASA is also working on Veer's aerosol product. And uh, once they become operational, maybe in next six months or so, uh, those NASA Veer's aerosol product will be available through the LATS web website. Okay, I think if there is no further question, uh, again, thank you everyone for attending this uh, webinar series. Uh, we hope it was useful and we will look forward to hear your feedback through the survey. Please do complete that survey. It's really very, very important for us to receive the feedback uh, so that we can uh, improve on our training, we can plan new training, we can introduce the new topics, 
and we can help you in best way we can do. Uh, I would like to thank Aaron also, the, Dr. Aaron Nagar. Please uh, thank you very much for providing very useful information and hopefully people and if you have if you start using the data product which dr aaron has uh, introduced today please do send him an email his contact uh, details should be there on the ppt or we can put that on our website please do shoot him, him an email and if you have a question he i i believe he will be happy to answer you uh, yes, other than that uh, thank you brock for making this happen and thank you everyone for attending. With that, uh, we'll see you next time.